I'll try to talk in my language. Francis Krauss, you had the was sock like a rainer, think a rainer, co I yet hark or a hot city. Yet catch a de hitch. Cry, see quaddy Dutch Hana ya hat. I mean, yaddy, yan yaddy Dutch Han hat city. Ach see, I ya. Denise Bambi Krauss, ye the was sock like a rainer, think a rainer, co I yet cock to tea to sigh. Ach ya hoa yel kacha di hikt city. Huko awa si kwedi dachan city. So, kikwane ya hat. Everybody be nice to my daughter. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Uh, just to uh, recognize a few other people in the room is my niece is here visiting from Seattle. It's Marissa Kraus, who's waved her hand. <clears throat> and my uncle, Owen James, is in the back of the room. And I uh, always like to uh, identify people who are very special to me and important to me. So I am visiting from Washington, D.C. And uh, just to make sure you all understand is that I came up here to learn as much as I came up here to share information with you. I work in Washington, which means I have a national level job. So I travel around the United States quite a bit. And uh, part of my responsibility is to work with all the tribal governments, and there are over 560 tribal governments around the United States. The membership of the group that I work with has over 60, that's 60 tribes, and they have some of the largest land reservations in the United States. So I work with the Navajo Indian Reservation, and they have a 17 million acre reservation that spans three states of the United States. And that we also work with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North and South Dakota, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota, the Colville Tribe in Washington State, the Yurok tribe in Northern California. And so what happens is that I spend a lot of my time working with the lower 48, and I don't have the opportunity to come up to Alaska very often to actually do what I do for a living. Part of that problem is that currently the United States doesn't recognize tribal historic preservation officer programs in Alaska. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But again, today I'm here to share information about what I do and to provide some uh, ideas for you that you might want to take back to your local villages and perhaps start up your own historic preservation program. I have three handouts and uh, I'll ask my niece to help with this and uh, again just to make sure everybody understands today's agenda is that I'm probably going to be here for about half an hour and then Ida is going to have the rest of the morning. Does that sound good? So it's according to my watch it's a quarter to 11 now so I'll be here to just do some general presentation on the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers and to give you some ideas on some possible programs that you might want to be involved in with yourself. So Marissa, if you don't mind doing uh, handing out the, are you going to do all three at once? Okay, do the May 20, 2006 one that says Tribal Historic Preservation Officers provide a variety of services. And this gives you an idea of what's going on around the country. And so for those of you who don't have the handout, again, I'm just giving you information to stir, stir people's imagination, to start thinking about what you could be doing in your local communities. I don't expect to give you, you know, you're not going to walk out of the room today saying, I know what to do. This is, again, just to share some basic information with you. So the tribes believe that this by having a program in their particular Indian reservation that it's, they're exercising their sovereign ability to have a program based on their sovereign nation, their sovereign status as an Indian nation. And that's a little bit foreign to up here in Alaska, but there is sovereignty up here. The United States government does recognize tribal governments up here in Alaska, so it's possible you could have your own program. A lot of the tribal historic preservation officers work with their federal agencies. So to bring this back to Alaska, the United States Forest Service does a lot of work up here in Alaska. That federal agency is mandated by law to work with the tribal governments up here in Alaska. They also, a lot of the programs do, they're responsible for, for providing the native language work that goes on. The Lac, <coughs> excuse me, the Lac de Flambeau tribe in northern Wisconsin 
is responsible for operating their Ojibwe language conservation program. And so they work with their elders in the schools to make sure that there's a program that's offered on preserving or rejuvenating the native language. And I say rejuvenating because Alaska is not that different from a lot of the states, a lot of the tribes in the lower 48. There are so many similarities about what happened and continues to happen up here and what's happening down in the lower 48. And um, the, uh, again, I don't have the time to get into the history of the relationship between the United States government and federal Indian tribes, but there has been a lot of uh, conflict that continues. Self-identity is a big issue throughout the United States. Low self-esteem in Native people is, goes throughout the United States. And uh, again, I could go on and on. And the reason why I like working in historic preservation is because there's so many opportunities to help tribal people overcome a lot of these hurdles. Uh, last night, Richard Downhauer came up with a, a short list of what, what, could, what could people do today to help preserve the native language and part of our communities going into the next generation. And uh, one of his comments I thought was really appropriate, and I wanted to make sure that I just expanded on and, and repeat it out loud again today, is that he said that every person who does something in your field, in historic preservation, native language, it doesn't matter, you are doing something important. So every little bit that we do makes a big difference. And so I, I thought that was a, you know, a great observation because that's how I feel. There's no other group in the United States that's actually working with tribal governments throughout the United States that's working to provide services at the local level to preserve what's important to you, whether that's your language, whether that's bringing back your native ancestors or sacred items from museums around the world. So that's what I do for a living back in Washington, D.C. Again, this one handout is uh, front and back, and it talks about the different things that people are doing throughout the country. And I think that's, you know, again, that's just to give you an idea. Uh, one thing that the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers is getting more involved in is tribal museums and cultural centers. We received a, a major grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to provide training for uh, museum staff and provide internships throughout the country. It's a two-year program and we're about to finish the planning of it and start uh, actually offering people uh, an application to fill out, et cetera, et cetera. But in the meantime, the Institute of Museum and Library Services has a new grant program. It's just in their third year and I provided you a handout for the announcement because the deadline is April 1st. And so this uh, Native American, Native Hawaiian Museum Services grant program, that's uh, not for, even if you don't have a museum already, you can apply for funds to help plan your museum. Uh, it's been frustrating to work in the Native American graves protection and repatriation field because one of the comments that is expressed to tribal governments is that we can't give you anything back because you don't have the means or resources to take care of it. So for a hundred years, we've taken care of a sacred mask, and how can we possibly give it back to, for example, the village of Sitka, because you don't have a museum here. You're not gonna be able to take care of it the way that it needs to be taken care of. So sometimes uh, the fact that tribes don't have existing structures is an excuse for people not to repatriate sacred items and native ancestral remains. So in the meantime, we're just trying to get the word out that uh, this Native American, Native Hawaiian Museum Services has a grant program that you could provide. You could apply for money to do some planning work. You could also inventory your collection. And uh, it's another opportunity for people to explore. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act has a grant program that would allow you to, if you were awarded a grant, would allow you to, for example, go to different museums and view items, do research on what holdings they have. So there are different grant opportunities. And then uh, finally, there's a handout that's very technical, and uh, it's called Excerpts from the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And I went through the federal law and 
uh, put this onto two pages to show you the pertinent sections that people need to know. And again, this may not be the exact place for you to learn about the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 101D2, but you might be able to take this handout back to somebody and say, I heard about a program that we might be interested in, and uh, I put this handout together to make it as easy as possible for you to know what the exact citation is. Background on the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. In the 60s, there was a nationwide move in urban development. People were tearing down buildings in uh, major metropolitan areas that had been there for 100, 100 years or so. And so th throughout the country, there was this effort to put up these cement buildings, the uh, glass walls, and take away the character of the, you know, of the main street is what they call it. So for, for example, in Sitka, the main street would be, I don't know the name of the street, that has the church. The Sitka Hotel has been there forever. And so in the 60s, people were saying, we need to improve, we need to make things uh, modern. So they would just tear down the church and the Sitka Hotel, for example, just tear down this whole stretch and put in a whole new series of brand new buildings, which had no character, and they looked the same whether you went to Sitka or whether you were in New York City. So people got together in the 60s and realized this, and they passed the National Historic Preservation Act. And that was to make sure that there was some remaining character, original character of the cities around the United States. It wasn't until 1992, however, that the tribal point of view was actually inserted into the act. So from 1966 until 1982, America, through the, through the work of the state governments, for example, the state of Alaska, we're told that <clears throat> the tribal governments here would have to work with the state of Alaska. So in Washington, the tribes were told, and there are almost 40 tribes, or over 40 tribes in Washington state, they were told that you had to go through your state to work on any historic preservation program. And from my experience of 25 years of working on national Indian affairs, Nobody knows what's going on in your local tribal communities except you. I haven't found any state government that has a, a great working relationship that's supporting tribal governments. Apparently, the thinking was that, for example, the state of Alaska gets $600,000 a year, and they have for 40 years. So the thinking was $600,000, and they would give money to local tribal communities to do historic preservation. Well, in 40 years, I may have found three programs, three states that actually did that. So for 40 years, the state got all this money based on their land base, their community, their archaeology sites, their historic structures, and they had all this money, and not, no more than three actually made it to the local level. So to, in other words, Alaska, the state of Alaska got $600,000. As far as I know, they've never given a grant to Sitka to do a survey of the historic structures, the archaeology sites. So there's this huge void. So in 1992, people got together and said, we want to make sure that tribal governments have a seat at the table and they're part of the preservation program. And part of the amendments was to create the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Program. So that's where the THBO stuff comes in. You have the state historic preservation officers, the tribal historic preservation officers, are local communities that get a special designation and then no longer do they have to wait for the state to do the work for them. So this is a radical idea in, in some parts of the country, but uh, a lot of people are getting it now. And so there we're up to 66 tribal historic preservation officers throughout the country. And they're large and small tribes, they're rich and poor tribes. And they realize that it's a great opportunity to be responsible for their own historic properties. As an aside, people say, well, the tribes can't do it. They don't know what they're doing. They're not trained. And there's all these excuses for why they don't feel like the tribes can do it for themselves. And my smart aleck response when it's called for <laughs> is that the states for 40 years got all this money to do work with tribes, and they didn't do anything, and somehow that didn't make a difference. But now you're saying that the tribe can't do it? I mean, the tribe can't get the money and not do anything? It was okay to give the money to the state and not do anything, but it's not okay to give the money to the tribe and not do anything. That's a smart aleck response. I hardly ever say that. And I'm using it as an example today of what I consider to be um, 
I don't feel like it's a positive way to work with tribal governments to say that you can't do it. Uh, one of the big problems we have is that a lot of people don't respect the tribal point of view, the oral history point of view, and they have to have everything proven by s Western science. So that's another uh, problem that we encounter. So going back to this legal handout, the THPO program is section 101, and if you go down to the very bottom, it has the letter D, and then the number two, and that's what a THPO program is. It's section 101D2 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And you might want to take that back to your uh, um, Alaska Native Village corporation or organization and say, hey, I heard about some new program that we might be able to get part of. And uh, I'll, I'll run through this PowerPoint quickly and I'll give you my email address and my website and you can always correspond that way. And um, so this is a, a concept that could be implemented in Alaska. There are a couple hurdles to overcome and uh, I'm in Washington DC to help you overcome those hurdles. That's my job. And so uh, I want to make sure everybody understands that's what I do. And I hardly ever get to work with Alaska. That's one of my frustrations because there's so much going on in the lower 48 and Alaska's left out of different parts of it. And um, so if you give me an excuse to come up to Alaska too, I'll be happy to come up here. So that's uh, in a nutshell. I'm just, again, this, this is a new concept up here and it's not completely clear how it's gonna work in Alaska but it really depends on the interest of the local community. So it's gonna take Sitka, Ketchikan, Cake, uh, Huna, Angoon, all people in the Southeast are gonna have to get interested and start making some phone calls and you know, I'm hoping to work with you in getting to overcome those hurdles. So um, I was gonna run through a quick PowerPoint on what I do during the day. I get this question all the time from everybody, what do you do? What do you do in Washington, D.C.? And it's um, it's almost impossible to answer in a nutshell because I, I do lobbying, I do technical assistance, I get a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, I answer a lot of questions about, I try not to get too involved in this. People call my office and they say, I heard I'm part Indian, I want to know how do I find out which tribe I'm at, because they say historic preservation. and So in DC you get a lot of um, Requests, most I can't answer, but when it comes to historic preservation, I can answer just about anything or know someone who can help me. So I'm gonna run through this quick PowerPoint and it's really technical. I, I, I kind of adjusted it from something I had to do in Florida recently. So I don't wanna, oh, get, don't get bogged down in the details and it's my understanding that this will be part of the record or do you have to buy the $340? Okay, so part of the record is you get this PowerPoint and read it more closely later. Twelve dollars and fifty cents will buy you the. This, this okay, this what a version. what a deal! You're gonna want to buy it. So um, I just went through this, and uh, I described the uh, state and federal partnership. That's what they call it, and the tribes are left out. There wasn't a mechanism to get tribes money directly, and so that's the, the, one of the big benefits of the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Program. They actually get a grant from the National Park Service. The Park Service is huge, by the way. Uh, I have, they have the local one here, they have the national one, they have regional offices. I mean, it's just a vast uh, bureau bureaucratic system. The 92 amendments I explained was the first time that the tribes really included Again, I, I don't want to get too involved in this because it's something you can read later or if you uh, email me or if you can call me, I can always send this PowerPoint presentation to you for free. <laughs> the regulatory process is uh, part of what I do in Washington, D.C. and that means federal register notices, getting supplying comments to different federal people. It's kind of amazing what you have to learn to operate in Washington, D.C. Uh, and this is just something that, you know, everyone needs to know this. If you work in Indian country, you have an act, and then that act needs to be put into a federal code. So that's why they publish notices in the Federal Register. They have to publish it in the Federal Register for public comment. And then that agency determines from the comments what the final, what the final rule will be. So, uh, you know, there's all these important steps that Indian people have to pay attention to. 
just to give you an idea of uh, the developing nature of what people understand about Indian country is, so you had the 92 amendments, and it was six years later that the agency that was responsible for putting together the code that translated from the law to an actual working document on how you were going to implement the 92 amendments. The 92 amendments by now you figured out was a big thing for Indian country. In 1998, they still hadn't talked to any Indian people. And so in a previous job, about four of us got together and managed to come up with enough votes to convince people that they had to at least meet and talk to the tribal people. And so they had regional meetings and, uh, you know, it's been a learning experience for them since. But there's a lot of, uh, people are still working on how do you work with tribal governments. It, most people try and ignore it because it's time consuming and it's expensive. My, my point on that is, you know, you should have been working with us 200 years ago. And so you're not going to shortchange me now because it's the law and you have to. So I, I try and be polite, but the bottom line is that they're supposed to. Money is a, is a big issue. Uh, the first round of tribal historic preservation officers, I listed them there, are the Colville of Washington, the Wallapai of Arizona, Lac de Flambeau is in Wisconsin, Leech Lake Tribe is in northern Minnesota, the Navajo is in Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, Mill Lacs is in northern Minnesota, Salish and Kootenai are in the Montana, Spokane Tribe, everybody knows in eastern Washington. Standing Rock is a reservation that spans the boundaries of North and South Dakota. The Umatilla in Oregon. You have the Warm Springs in Oregon outside of Portland and the Yurok in Northern California. So I, I'm using these here to give you an idea of who I've been working with. So those are the first 12 and I've gotten to know them very well. And uh, this money thing and it's not really Trust me, we could spend a whole hour just on talking about money. So I'm just going to let you know that there's not a lot of money in it. Most people don't get into this, don't operate a program for the money, but for the status that comes along with it. Because once you have a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer program, they know by law and by regulation they have to meet with you and talk to you. They do already, but this is just like yet another way of confirming that they're supposed to be working with you. So NAFPO, the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, is a 501c3. We work with federally recognized tribes. We don't work with individuals. We work with tribal governments. Uh, according to the National Historic Preservation Act, that means the, the legal definition of Indian tribes for the National Historic Preservation Act are the identified local governments, Alaska Native villages and corporations, and Native Hawaiian organizations. So that includes ANCs and ANVs. So we do training. Uh, I would love to come up here and do a training on some of this stuff, and that's probably something that I need to work on. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, because I told the organizers of this conference that I'd love to help work on the next conference. And uh, if that's you know, next year or every other year, when alternating with celebration, I'd love to help work on the next conference. Those are basic things we uh, do. I'm in Washington, D.C. I don't have my own office. I sublet from the Benton Foundation, which is fine because they provide the you know, infrastructure for me. I can just plug in my computer to their T1 line. So this is just to give you an idea of, of uh, what, is, what my job is like in Washington. So actually, we have over 60 members now, and that's a lot of people to keep track of. We're not a federal agency. I'm always amazed that people think that, you know, I work for the federal government. So I have to make sure everybody understands that I don't. I also don't represent individual local governments. That's a big deal because some federal agencies say I have a, a case in uh, Arizona that I, you know, a project, a development project, they're putting in a, a sewer line for the Indian Health Service Clinic. And so, Bambi, could you tell me whether that's going to impact a tribal government or not? And I, you know, I'm making this as absurd as possible, but it's getting the point across, which is I tell them, you have to talk to the Navajo Indian, uh, the Navajo Nation. So I don't ever represent any individual tribal government. I look at the national perspective. I look at, for example, the funding. I look at the big picture.
We've been in existence since uh, 1998, and I started in, um, they organized and incorporated in 98, and I started working there in 99, so this is just to give people an idea of what we do. We have an annual meeting, and uh, this is to, I know you can't possibly read that in the back, but um, we have meetings throughout the country. We try and hold them in, on Indian reservations to bring the money to the local community and to also allow for field trips for people to learn more about their host tribes. So for example, the seventh annual meeting was at the Lac de Flambeau, uh, hosted the meeting and we all went to um, northern Wisconsin in August. The next meeting will probably be in uh, Palm Springs in October. The Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians would like to host it. They're one of the more successful gaming tribes. They also, they happen to own about half of Palm Springs, so <clears throat> they have quite a bit of resources. <coughs> NAFPA also is the only national organization that really deals with Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So we had, we hosted a special meeting for the 15th anniversary of NAGPRA. And that was in November of 05 in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Just give you an idea of, this is actually the um, second annual meeting. It was held on the Navajo Indian Reservation. Uh, they have, you can imagine the history you know about here and you hear about here. Every local Indian community has their stories and their special places. And I mean, it, so it, it's a, a great job if you like th that to learn. If you're, if you're open to learning about all these different special things and people, then this is a great job. This is actually Window Rock, Arizona. That's the, where the Navajo Nation is, their capital is uh, Window Rock, Arizona. and. Uh, to give you an idea of, you know, what I have to learn and keep up with is Window Rock, which is this hole in the wall, is actually a sacred site to the Navajo. They consider these holes to be sacred. And the United States government planted a fort right at the base of this uh, sacred site for the Navajo Nation because they were doing it on purpose. They were making a point that we're conquering you and we're going to put our fort right at the base of your sacred site. So again, I want to make sure everybody understands that uh, the history in Southeast Alaska is not much different from the history throughout the United States. We do research. I've done quite a bit of work in heritage tourism recently, and uh, I really enjoy it. It's, it's a way to try and make sure that local communities aren't taken advantage of. So for example, you don't want a, a cruise ship to show up just like I mentioned the sacred site of Windrock, Arizona, you don't want the cruise ship depositing a thousand people at the, you know, on one of your sacred sites. So there is a way to do tourism and uh, it does take some planning and local community support. So we've done some work in that. I also was involved, I am involved in a major study on the United States treaties with American Indians that the Department of Defense contracted for us. So I know that's not such a big issue up here, but it's something I've had to work on. Are cell towers a big issue up here? Putting in cell towers? Apparently not, because Sprint doesn't work up here. <laughs> but it's a big issue in the lower 48. People uh, in one month will get a stack of letters from cell towers this high saying, uh, I want to put up a cell tower and I need to know whether or not it's going to impact a historic property that is sacred to an Indian tribe. I put this one up here because um, this is how I feel about what I do for a living. I, I'm hoping that people are going to get excited about historic preservation because it, it can be very positive. It's not about the past. It's not about, you know, just suffering again and again through what has happened to Indian people. It's a way of taking control of what's happened already and uh, helping your people overcome some of these things that continue, and they're going to continue until we say no. And so I feel that, um, like I've just explained the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Program, and it's a positive thing for most tribal communities. It gives them a, a central focus, and then from the central program, then they can, you know, do the native language. They work with, for example, the National Oceanic Administration, whatever NOAA stands for. 
and uh, they do interpretation for the National Park Service at National Seashores. So there are some great opportunities to work in this. But it really is about taking control. And so I think that if tribal people can get, you know, if they really want to get committed to this and spend a lot of time on it, you will be writing the United States history. Because if you're not writing it, someone's doing it for you. And I'm not saying you have to tell everybody sacred sites or anything of sensitive nature, but you can provide the Indian point of view. And so, for example, uh, I've been working with my mother on uh, trying to figure out the way of handling the bombing of Cake, Alaska. The United States Navy destroyed Cake, Alaska. How many of you knew that before? I'm going to raise the hands. Some people don't know that. They know Angoon was, but they don't know Cake was also. And so if, I'm not saying I have to be that person. If Cake or people who are related to Cake don't figure out a way of sharing that, whether or not it's right or not, I'm not going to describe that. But if people from Cake aren't going to make that known, nobody will ever know that. I, was, I had to give a speech at a meeting a couple of weeks ago and I explained to them that I personally have a very complex relationship with the United States government. The United States Navy destroyed my traditional village. I have a big grant from the Department of Defense to do a study on treaties. <laughs> so, you know, people don't consider, they don't think of what it's like to be an Indian in the United States today. So we're being asked to be scientists, to be carriers of oral tradition, to know your ceremonies. You know, thank goodness we're that smart, but <laughs> it's still a lot of work. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that if we're not going to do it, and if you're happy letting somebody else write your story, then, you know, go ahead. But I'd like to be able to step up and be part of the world that is actually telling it from a tribal point of view. I also i am hoping that these programs are going to allow people to have a tribal agenda. So, for example, I spent most of the past two months working on federal appropriations. That means going and meeting with different senators and congressional staff in Washington, D.C. I don't really like doing that. I don't like spending my time doing that because I'd rather be learning Clinkett. And that's been the toughest thing for me is to, you know, I can't ignore the national agenda. And so at my own personal decisions, I have to give up something that's important to me, which is learning how to speak Clinkett, because I have to go meet with Senator Lisa Murkowski. And so if we could ever get to the point of having and doing our own tribal agenda, that would be you know, my dream come true. And that's not just true for historic preservation. Almost everybody I know who works in Indian Affairs on the national level, we spend most of our time educating everybody else on who we are and what we do and where we live and what's important to us. But I'd rather be spending my time on other projects. But unfortunately, I still have to spend most of my time responding to uh, the mainstream society agenda. So this is uh, our website. We have, I have a free service called eNews from NAFPO. And uh, if you send me, a, I'm hoping most of you have email. It's just something I send out online. And so if there's a, a story on something important, I will make it as easy as possible to, so you can read it. I usually don't send large PDFs, and I don't send everything out. So you probably get like one or two emails a week from me. But it's news stories from around the country and what's going on throughout the country. And so my email address is bambi at nathpo.org. And um, I'm trying to figure out the, the, the conference registration included everybody's information so maybe if you send out the registration list that you'll get this email address and uh, our website is www.nathpo.org so even if you don't have my email address you can go to the website and send a message and I'll get that so that's actually 11:15 or so and uh, again I came up here to learn to see family uh, to just share some information with you to give you an idea of what's out there and hopefully get people inspired to do something. And so again, um, I feel like I need to come back and do a training and meet with local communities to try and do some more planning, but I was, I appreciated the opportunity to come up here and have this time with you. So thank you very much.
Good morning. It's wonderful to be here at this, uh, my grandmother's country, Gunnachish. In our culture, we always start off with a prayer, so I'm going to follow tradition if you just bear with me. Achan chau, achan chau, stun ha ilyech, ijis ye jenek echasati, chahawak shik yenesni, i etzakahini, ha shagun isiti, ik a kak kokartus tea, ada et et kiw akweyach, you nach tu skitk, sishaji narek, ya ha shuga. Itu dag et was ku hak osit kasagen a kag ya kaktu adi hatu enat et et sakhanetin era hakas nehak esiti kaha an kau O my God O my God unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose may they follow thy commandments and abide in thy laws help them O God in their endeavors and grant them strength to serve thee. O oh God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of knowledge and share their hearts by thy love. Verily, thou art their helper and their Lord. Gunlishish. This picture here on the screen is a picture of uh, my grandmother my mother, myself, and my oldest daughter, Georgie, Georgiana. Um, she's down here with me um, this time, but she's at a different, uh, a, a different uh, workshop. <clears throat> my grandmother's name is Tla and Kak and She. And when I was born, my grandmother was there, and she gave me her name. So I was really, really blessed by having her name because she took an interest in my upbringing. When I was a little girl, she used to take me out with her and, uh, and I help her um, pick medicines. And my grandmother, you can see there, um, her eyes were blue when I remember her because she had cataracts growing over her eyes during um, the flu epidemic and on all the diseases that came up into our country in the 1800s. My grandmother lost her, her, um, her first uh, family with all, that, uh, with all the diseases. They were living in Dai Yi, that's just out of Skagway. Originally, her grandmother, her mother came from Angoon, so <clears throat> I'm a Deshi Ton, same as my grandmother, and and we 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 use we use the split tail beaver, as you can see it on the back of my vest. I also I also wear it on my necklace here. <clears throat> and my grandmother got married in Lan, and and um, but they lived in in uh, Skagway in Dai Yi. It used to be a big city there in Dai Yi, but because of the way the, um, the, uh, the, the water was shallow there for the big ships and stuff, so they, they went over to Skagway and, uh, and Dai Yi. <clears throat> I'm not sure when, but I think in the 1920s there was a fire there and it, uh, it wiped out the city and all the houses that were there. My grandparents had a house there. And uh, <clears throat> I was really... Um, lucky to uh, to have my grandmother my grandmother my grandfather died in 1920 and uh, so uh, my mother being the eldest daughter uh, had the responsibility of taking care of my grand my grandmother and the rest of the siblings the other children went to school in the mission school my mom was in school only for two years but um, her one of her sisters died in school and um and so my grandpa got mad and took the kids out, her and, and my uncle, my uncle Johnny. My uncle Johnny all my life was the, um, was the, um, uh, the leader of our clan. And uh, his name was Yeltsian. And I hear uh, people uh, have that name down here, quite a few. 
quite a few people, but that was a really, um, uh, he was a really good uh, leader. And we followed the tradition in our at home, even though um, it was outlawed up there as well as down here. And <clears throat> I was really lucky that uh, that Grandma took an interest in me because my name was the same as hers, Yeltsin, Tla and Kak and She. Um. I I am my I'm a storyteller also. I um, after my mother died about three weeks after my mother died, I I and another cousin went over to uh, New Mexico to uh, to take in a workshop there, and um, there was always already in the works before my mom passed on, and uh, when uh, when she passed on, we we decided to carry on. And I knew one of the organizers that was organizing that workshop, and he, as soon as he saw us, he told us that he had a place uh, for me to speak in a couple of days, he said, because somebody, one of the speakers um, couldn't come, and would I take um, her place? And I said, uh, go away with you. I came down here to learn <laughs> from you people. And um, and he said, well, he said, I'll, I'll let you think about it, he said. So in the meantime, I went around in the country like I'm really interested in traveling in the country and stuff. And I walked around in, in that place and I found a lot of similarity in, in the plants. They, were, they had dandelions there and dandelions, everybody know dandelions. They had yarrow growing all over the place and they had, they had a juniper, this marvelous big, trees of juniper was just, I wished I could have taken one home <clears throat> because they were so big, they looked like the berries on it, the juniper looked on it uh, like berries um, on it. And um, so uh, I guess we'll start with this program we're doing today, I usually do in about two days, and now I have just a, a, what, 25 minutes, something like that? 20 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, we'll just go on with the um, with those uh, uh, slides. I think <clears throat> we know that uh, plants are different in every area, so you have to try the, all the different plants. And um, we uh, don't have medicines for the new uh, diseases, but uh, but uh, we do have stuff that help um, help a little bit. I have a cousin that uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and they gave him three months. And he lived for um, about two and a half years. My mother, um, I went home to take care of her. I was nursing at the hospital in Whitehorse when my mom became ill. And, um, well, the doctor said she had cancer of the esophagus. We had to uh, blend all her food to, gi to give to her, just like baby food. And, uh, and, and uh, take care of her like that. But she lived, uh, you can keep on. But she, um, she lived for um, 11 years. About five years after, um, <clears throat> after um, they, um, uh, she got sick, she, something was wrong with her. I can't remember now what was wrong with her, but uh, she had something that she had to go to the hospital for. And uh, I was walking down the hall, and I knew, I knew pretty well all the doctors at that time because, remember, I worked there for 12 years. I met the surgeon walking down. He said hello to me, and he was walking on, and then he got halfway down the hall, and he stopped, and he hollered back at me and said, what are you doing to your mother? And I said, everything you told me to. And he said, oh, you must be doing something else, he said. And, uh, and I just laughed and went on. So, but it does work. Um, uh, we don't have a cure, but, uh, but we, we know that uh, traditional medicines work in, in a lot of cases. <clears throat> Sage we use, I have a pamphlet up here with all of these uh, medicines on it. <clears throat> I, um, I'm retired and I, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, getting any money for, uh, um, any of uh, any you know other than uh, than workshops, and I get I get uh, I go and and do workshops all over the place, 
and uh, these, all of these things uh, work. Everybody has sage, we know that, and uh, the sage is um, we use for ceremonial purposes, and we also use it to, uh, to um, for, um, you know, to, to make a really good, uh, if you want to cleanse your house, we use it for cleansing purposes. The puffball mushrooms, um, I don't know if we have any here, but at home we have lots of them going in the force. And it, when you step on it, it just puffs right out. Um, they, uh, it, it's when it's dry, it, it works like that. And, and uh, you, you use uh, the um, mushrooms and you put it on your, um, your burns if you have a bad burn. One of my brothers burned himself one time. You know, a long time ago, we just, we just had uh, heat in the house with um, um, what they call Yukon heaters and stuff. And, and um, we had no running water and stuff. So he was having a bath one day and he backed up into the, um, the, into the stove. And when he pulled away from the stove, his, um, the first layer of his skin was stuck right on the stove. That's how badly his cheek, his little cheek was. And uh, of course, uh, Karklas in the Yukon was really uh, isolated and we couldn't get any medical help and everything right away. And, and my poor brother cried and cried all that day, all that evening and all that night he cried. Nobody got hardly any sleep because he was hurting so much. And, and uh, what my mom did is um, she got sage Sage works just as well for uh, for burns. She took, she dug the snow off the side of the hill. She remembered where she saw some sage, and she took the sage and then she she uh, dried it in the oven and then she um, she um, powdered it all up the stems of the sage and some of them, and 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 then she put that on on his burn because it was just uh, it was really wet and and really really bleeding, and. Uh, and in a few minutes, he stopped crying and he went to sleep. And uh, that was the beginning of his healing. So the sage works just as good as the puffballs, puffball mushrooms. And also the puffball mushrooms, um, if you get them when they're fresh, they're really good eating fried. <laughs> yeah? Uh, how do you prepare the sage? You dry it. You dry it and then, and then you... Um, you um, you have um, if you have a bowl, or you know you can uh, you can um, you can powder it up like that, or you can just keep it dried. I think I have a bag of sage here with me. I'll dig it out after. <clears throat> we dry all of our medicines, um, bec uh, or we can keep them in the deep freeze, but. It takes up a lot of room when you put it in the deep freeze, so most of our medicines are dried. I brought a few bags of, of stuff with me, but I didn't put it out yet. <clears throat> Some people, um, the crocuses is really good. You know the crocuses that, that, uh, that um, are in the bush in the, in the springtime? If you chew the leaf on that, it'll, it'll numb your lip and your gums. The old people used to use that sometimes for um, Babies when they're teething and stuff, and they when they got sore mouth and stuff. But our babies hardly ever um, get sore mouth because uh, <clears throat> we give them dry meat and bones to chew on and stuff to toughen their gums and stuff. And I remember one time when uh, I was a young girl and my um, my sister had her baby at home. Her husband was in the war, so she came home and stayed at our house um, until her husband came home. And um, and and she had this little baby, and my mom gave him a piece of dry meat, and uh, she tied a string onto it, a long string, and and the baby would chew on that dry meat. And I told her, "What do you tie this string on here for?" Because remember, I was young and I was raised in school, and I didn't know nothing. <laughs> mom said, "Oh, that string is to." have a hold of that meat, so if he decide to swallow it, she said he won't choke on it, she said to me. <laughs> you can yard it back out, she said. <laughs> yeah? And I remember when we were small, and there's just like a fat, you tie a string to it, and they suck on it too, and yeah. it was good for the baby. Yeah. And then I remember it was a fat of... Uh-huh. 
Um, it was uh, uh, really, really interesting to see when I worked at the hospital. I worked mostly on pediatrics with the children and uh, sometimes in maternity because I loved working with babies. And um, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, a lot of the white babies came in with uh, sore gums and, and, you know, infection of the of the gums and stuff like that. And there was not very many um, of our babies go in there because we gave them bones to chew on, rabbit bones or chicken bones or anything like that to, to chew on them. And uh, so um, it toughened their gums and they... Um, they really got the exercise with their gums with the dry meat and dry fish. And the, the crocuses, I use that uh, sometimes, like I say, for a sore mouth and sore teeth. They also, uh, I remember when my grandma, you know, she had a medicine bag, just, li just like I have. Actually, I, I'd like to take time to tell you about my medicine bag. My medicine bag is uh, one that my my uncle, my uncle on my <coughs> my dad's um, um, brother-in-law gave to him. It's got the beaver on it, and it's really very old. It's just coming apart on me. I hate to put it away, but I always feel good when I use it because he was a a really big medicine man, and um, he uh, he wanted to give something to my father, so. He gave this medicine bag to my father, and it belonged to his mother's sister. And and she, he, they were Deshiton, so they had the beavers. My father was Yenyedi from the Wolf Clan, so he was not allowed to use it in public. But it hung in the bedroom all the time on the foot of their bed, my parents' bed. But on, when he died, like um, when um, my mom was giving all his stuff his clothes back to his things, uh, back to his uh, nephews. Um, this bag, because it was a Deshiton bag, uh, she gave to me because I was the youngest, and I was the one that was uh, taking care of all of their um, their um, problems and stuff that they had. They always called me. I was the youngest of eight children, but only four of us uh, grew up. Um, it, it sure is sad when I think about it, like when I see the death certificates of my, my brothers and sisters. and I can't imagine losing a small baby like that because uh, I have five children of my own and, and, uh, and I think about how I would have felt if I had lost any of my babies. Uh, those old people sure had a tough, yeah, so it's, it's something. And like my grandmother in, in Dai, they had um, they had the spirit house there in Dai, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> anyway, this is my, my medicine bag, and I always feel really good when I use it because whenever I do a public speak, I always talk and talk, and I, I always pray that the the people um, in the next world would would let me say things that um, that are good things. <clears throat> My grandmother had little uh, bits of pieces of uh, driftwood in her, in her medicine bag, about as big as my thumb and about that long, and I couldn't figure out what those little things were. And so I asked her, and she said, those are driftwood that she find on the beach, on the coast, she said, and, and it's all full of salt, natural salt. And whenever they have um, an infected tooth or something, they put that uh, that driftwood in uh, next to their gums, just like the dentist do when he's working on your teeth. He always has those big cotton balls in there, and they had those those little sticks. So I couldn't figure out why she would do that. But when I got older, I realized that that the salt, the natural salt from the salt water, was in that driftwood, and that's why she she um, put it there. So it it was. Uh, it was uh, really, the, the old people really had, had a lot of knowledge. I had a young girl that I was really interested at home, and uh, myself and two other elders were really training her to uh, be the next uh, person to be an educator about traditional medicines. Unfortunately, she got um, cancer and she passed on. And one of the other ladies is the one that used a bear, 
the bear stick, and um, I don't have a clue what that one is because I don't, I never used it. So I know they use that up, up in the, up in our country too. And the angel hair, they say they use that too, and it's that black stuff that grows on the trees, and they said they use that for uh, medicines also. I myself haven't used that, or my grandma never, never told me about that. The roses, uh, the roses, you can pass that over now. The roses too is really good. Everybody has roses all over the place. The rose petals, if you pick rose petals and get about a handful of rose petals and pour boiling water over it, or you let it boil, um, you can use that for eye wash. And it's really very good. One of my cousins used that for her eye wash and uh, she really liked it. And myself, uh, I like to uh, pick it and, and uh, just uh, sometimes use it for jelly. They make really good jelly, but we don't use it very often because they've got so many um, little uh, seeds in it. It's hard, to, uh, it's hard to work with it. There's so many other berries that we have that it's easier to work with. But the, the, but the rose petals uh, makes a really good eye wash. My mom used to use um, pitch um, for eye wash, just a pitch off of spruce trees. And, and uh, that, that um, we liked better. And you always have to, you put your water through a, um, a strainer. Nowadays we have the coffee strainers that um, my grandmother used to use a cloth to strain her medicines with. But now we're spoiled and we can use coffee strainers and it works just as good. <clears throat> the red alder is good for, um, for uh, if you have uh, ulcers um, and you, you boil it, you boil your medicines for um, at least 25 to 30 minutes, no longer than that because it becomes really very bitter. You take a couple of strips about 18 inches long and about an, um, an inch and a half wide and <clears throat> you um, and you boil it in an aluminum pot or um, a, a glass, a Pyrex one not aluminum, um, enamel. The enum, aluminum pot or the stainless steel, uh, some stuff out, comes out of those pots and we never use that pot, those kinds of pots. You have to use enamel. I'm so aware of the time, the shortage of time that I... I think you're okay because I, I thought there were others. Since Bambi spoke shorter mm -hmm. and lunch times at noon, you still got about 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. okay. right. I just got a little bit more time. <laughs> <clears throat> the red alder, we, we use that. You, when you're picking your, um, your bark, you, you go to the, um, to the north side of the tree. Where the sun comes up, you go on the other side of it because the sun is so, um, so strong that it, it uh, makes the, um, the, um, the sap, uh, it dries up the sap much, much quicker. And so you go to the north side and, and when you pick your, your uh, bark, and you take about uh, 18 inches long, something like that, and you get a couple of those in a gallon and a half of water. And you boil it for 25 to 30 minutes. Once it's boiled, um, and as soon as it cools off, you put it in, in glass jars and, and, and keep it in glass. You don't put it in plastic because, again, there's something in the plastic that, uh, that goes into the medicines and it's not as pure. And you can keep it for at least six months. I know it works. It, it works really good. Okay. And um, the Hudson Bay tea or Labrador tea, um, that um, that's really good uh, for um, bad coughs. People use it for bad coughs, and it's good for um, for you um, if you um, if you have bad nerves. It, it helps. I remember um, when my dad and my mom went out um, hunting or setting debts and stuff like that, they, they used to leave us kids with grandma and grandma was getting really on in years and, and she always tell us she's gonna give us a treat. So she would make a Hudson Bay tea and she'd put a little bit of black tea with it. And oh, we really got a good treat, but uh, you know, when mom came, we were all really good kids and we were sleeping. <laughs> I never knew. <laughs> I never knew that uh, until I grew up that uh, there was something in that tea that um, that you know settled our nerves and made us good kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
Yarrow, you, Yarrow grows everywhere. Um, you know, they're about a, a foot and a half long, and they have little white flowers on it. I think I have a bag here with me, and that really is good for, um, for upset stomach. <clears throat> My husband um, is French. His name is um, Henry, Henry Calmegan, and um, actually it's pronounced Calmejan. But he had the J changed to G. That's how we got uh, J in there. Because everybody was calling him Cal Jane. <laughs> you know how Canadians are. <laughs> and he didn't like that. He didn't like to be called Jane. So he, that's, that's why it, it got a change. And he, and he at first, uh, you know, uh, thought I was nuts by, by using all these medicines. And, and one day we were sitting in the living room and watching TV and we had two big chairs, one big chair on each side of the room and we we're watching a TV and it was a really interesting program. And uh, all of a sudden he said, uh, Mother, have you got uh, something for my stomach? He said, I tried some Tums, I tried some Rolaids, and he said, I even took some Alka-Seltzer. He said, nothing works. He said, I really feel awful, really bloated up, he said, and terrible. So I went and I got some uh, some yarrow and I put I put a handful in a in a two um, two cup measuring glass measuring cup a Pyrex cup. I poured boiling water over it and then I had a I had a chopstick a wooden chopstick and I I poked that medicine down in it like that and I took it over to him and and uh, <clears throat> I tell him uh, as soon as it gets cold enough I said you take you take a sip out of this. And, and uh, I said, and you keep turning it, the leaves over, the, the flowers over with this, with this wooden spoon, I told him. Okay, he said. And, and I went, I was sitting, knitting, and, and watching the t this good show. And all of a sudden, he told me, uh, boy, do I ever feel good, he said. Oh, and I said, how much did you drink? And I looked, and he said, all of it. All of it? I said, my God, I must have killed you, I told him. <laughs> Because when we're taking medicines, we only take, um, at the beginning, we take about a half a cup and about, um, about a quarter of a cup, and we do that four times a day for at least 10 days. Uh, and um, when we have, uh, you know, other problems. But the yarrow really works right away, so for, um, for upset stomachs. And um, anyway, he didn't, he didn't die, which I was really happy. <laughs> And again, uh, uh, my friend that made these um, things for me, she she um, used um, the other people's medicine and that gentian. I don't know what that is. I've, I've never used it. And I think we had sage already. <clears throat> Traditional medicines. Um, these ones are the things that we use for... Um, for uh, um, when we have really, when we have diabetes, this is the best thing you could use is soap berries. And also the branches and the roots and everything, if you take, uh, it's good for um, gallbladder, if you have gallbladder. My m grandmother had a really bad case of gallstones one time and, and uh, they said she never got out of bed for about a week. My grandfather um, cooked up a big pot of that soap berries, the roots and, and leaves and everything, and he gave it to her. And she said after about two days she got out of bed and then she was starting to, to work around the house and everything. And she never ever had her gallstones and she was over 100 I think when she passed on. She never ever had her gallstones removed, but all of us in our family all had our gallstones removed. <laughs> so, because we never used soap berries. <laughs> it's really good. It's good to help um, to control your uh, diabetes, but like like um, I say, uh, there's nothing that uh, that cure diabetes, but we know some things that helps. Mossberries. Um, the the people in in the down the river use mossberries for um, for eyes when they have eye infections. We ourselves never use the mossberries, but those people down there down the river use it for eye infection. Um, it makes good pies, though, I know that. <laughs> and the stoneberries, um, 
and the people used to pick those all the time. We called them stoneberries, and it wasn't until I was starting to teach that I realized that it had a different name. They call it kinnikinnik. For a while, I couldn't say it, but now I like to say it, kinnikinnik. <laughs> we used to call it stoneberries. Grandma and, and them used to pick it, and you pick it in the, in the fall after it has a, a few good frosts, or in the spring, in the springtime, it, the hillsides are all green and, and uh, when the snow goes. And, and we know that it, it's, um, it's all the stoneberries there. And they, they become tan color. At first, when they first come, they're, uh, they're sort of, they're red. But when they're really good to eat, they turn tan color. And the people used to pick that a long time ago for, um, and they make uh, in, into big bricks like that with grease. And they and they um, use that for when they're hunting and stuff because it gives them gives them in. Sometimes they have to walk long ways to to uh, to get game and stuff. So they pack they pack the stoneberries and and grease uh, to help give them energy. Bear gall. You take the bear gall and and the people um, um, in the later generations. Is they use that? Um, they dry it and then they they um, pound it up, and then put it in capsules. You can buy those little capsules in the drugstore, and uh, and uh, you put uh, you put that bear gall in those capsules, and and uh, and they use it to help control um, uh, cancer. Um. I understand we don't have very much time. If anybody has any questions, I, I don't know everything, but I could try to help you. And remember, I told you that this um, program, I do, I usually take two days to do it. I usually take, talk about traditional medicines, and then I talk about, um, about uh, medicines that are really good for diabetes. Oh. <laughs> um. Questions for the video? Oh, right here. This is my moccasin. My um, my son-in-law, grandmother made it for me. You know, in our tradition, uh, when you're going to take a wife, you always uh, give your mother-in-law good presents. So she she gave she had this moccasins made in the up north because she came from uh, Fort Yukon, and uh, so this is where this came from. But I uh, live in the modern world, and I was so stingy for my moccasins, I had the sole put on bottom. <laughs> yeah? It would be very helpful if you had pictures of some of the things that you were talking about the next time you give us speech. Because some of the things I know are not familiar in this area. I know it's, um, it's hard. Um, but uh, you have you have a lot of things that uh, you, you use, like uh, you, everybody used dandelions. I didn't have time to talk about dandelions, and and also willows. You have willows here, and and uh, I'm sure you must have trembling aspen. We use the trembling aspen, the buds before it before it turns into leaf, and and you also have uh, the Douglas pine. So, I mean the Douglas. What is it called? Douglas fir, there must be pitch on those. I know, I know um, similar things have. I, um, I've, I've taught this in San Diego, this, um, this uh, medicine, and I also have taught in, in the, like I was telling you, in New Mexico. So, um, you know, I've, I've had a chance to look around and they have lots of things that are similar, yeah? We don't have devil's club growing up in the Yukon. So every time we see our, our um, family from southeast, we, uh, we always trade. I have some um, pamphlets that I was talking about here describing it, and, and I have a donation box for anybody that wants to donate for my paper and stuff. Remember, I'm retired, so <laughs> even paper costs lots to me. I have uh, caribou leaves here, 
Whatever you feel it's worth to you, you uh, donate. I believe it's used for all kinds of things. Everything. Is that the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is this? Oh, and uh, this is, um, Oh, go for weed. Um, what they call it? Pineapple. Oh, I can't remember. What is it? <clears throat> um, this is this um, helps helps the nerves. I have just a small package here of red alder. <clears throat> the reason we call it red alder is because it turns uh, the water red when you drink it, and and it's really good for bleeding ulcers. Hmm. One of my dear friends had um, had lots of stomach aches, and she's really getting elderly. And uh, I made a I made a pot uh, for her, and uh, she's uh, doing pretty good. She was doing pretty good with it and I believe that it was um, probably ulcers because because she really worried a lot. Most of the stuff up here is um, caribou leaves. Somebody, when I was coming down here, one of the ladies asked me to bring it, bring it down so I brought extra down here so I have lots. Hmm? Yeah, and you make it in the tea, you put it in about a gallon and a half of water in an enamel pot and you boil it not more than um, not more than uh, 25 to 30 minutes, and then as soon as it cools off, you pour it into a glass jar, and you can use it again a second boil, if you want. You don't have to put the whole thing in there; just half half a bag or quarter of a bag, whatever. You can make just a little bit. You don't have to do lots. Um, this one, she, I couldn't remember what it was. It's chamomile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I only have one because somebody took one yesterday. And all, uh, all the medicines that I talked about here are on this pamphlet, uh, so you can uh, you can help yourself to any of it if you want. Um, <clears throat> It's really funny, my mother, grandmother and my mom, they kept all of this information in their head mm -hmm. and uh, I became westernized and I put it on paper. <laughs> Sometimes I can't even remember when I see it. <laughs> I'm going, and my birthday coming up will be 79. So I hope, I was telling my daughter the other day, she was telling me I didn't go fast enough or something. I told her, I hope when you're 79, you can really walk fast. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky she's not here. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Goodness, sheesh. Um,